On June 23, 1993, in a grassy field across from a 7-Eleven, a police officer finds the severed penis of John Wayne Bobbitt. His wife, Lorena Bobbitt, admitted to the police that she had cut the appendage from her husband's body with a kitchen knife while he was asleep earlier that morning. What followed was a trial that would captivate the nation as millions of Americans watching sought the answer to one question. Was this act justified? Lorena Lenor Gallo was 19 years old when she met John Bobbitt, 21 at the time, at a dance hall near the U.S. Marine Corps base in Quantico, Virginia in 1988. She had moved to the U.S. a year prior on a student visa from Venezuela. At the time of their meeting, Lorena was still learning English, but despite the language barrier, there was an instant attraction. Lorena said of John, I thought John was very handsome, blue eyes, a man in uniform, you know? He was almost like a symbol, a Marine fighting for the country. I believed in this beautiful country. I was swept off my feet. I wanted my American dream. John said of Lorena, Lorena was pretty. She was innocent. She was real, real sweet. John was Lorena's first ever boyfriend. Up until their marriage, Lorena's family did not allow the two to go on dates without a chaperone present. After dating for 10 months, the two got married in 1989. The Bobbitt's marriage started having issues soon after it began. Tensions rose when John was discharged from the military in January of 1991. Thereafter, John would hold jobs for short periods of time as a cab driver, bar bouncer, construction worker, before losing them and becoming unemployed again. The resultant loss of income put pressure on Lorena, who worked as a manicurist at a nail salon, becoming the sole breadwinner for the family. Lorena alleged that John berated her. He told her that she was ugly, he mocked her ability to speak English, and he ridiculed her for her obsession with the American dream of wanting a big house and fancy cars. A month after their marriage, she recalls being driven home by John, who had been drinking and was swerving on the road going nearly 90 miles an hour. She begged him to stop and attempted to grab the steering wheel herself to steady the car, at which point he punched her in the chest. Back at the apartment, he proceeded to kick her, telling her not to cry. Lorena called the police, and as soon as they arrived, she recalled John's attitude changing in an instant. He became another person, calmed down and everything. He wasn't yelling. He's not aggressive. According to Lorena, this was the first time he hit her, but it would not be the last. John denies ever physically abusing Lorena, though much of her abuse is captured in photographs. Lorena tried to gather further evidence of John's physical and mental abuse using a secret tape recorder, which he found one night in her purse. Lorena claimed this discovery brought on another assault. Having grown up Catholic in Venezuela, Lorena cited that her faith was a factor for wanting to try to make things work with John. She convinced herself that he would change. Divorce was, for her, unthinkable. Two neighbors, Jonathan Kalpua and Jonathan Whitaker, claimed that John Bobbitt would brag about sexual exploits to them. He liked to make girls squirm and yell and make them bleed and yell for help, John Whitaker said in his court testimony. Similarly, Jonathan Kalpua reported that John Bobbitt said that the way he liked to have sex was forced sex because that turned him on. Lorena claims that she was raped repeatedly by her husband. He would be on top of me and he would use his hands to choke me. Every time he did, he'd hit me. He forced me into sex, I would just cry. John Bobbitt denies these sexual allegations. He claims that all sex between him and Lorena was consensual. On the topic of parenthood, John allegedly told her that she would make a terrible mother and that if she did have a child, he would refuse to support them. Lorena eventually did become pregnant and according to her, John forced her to have an abortion. She claimed he told her, you cannot have this child. You're going to go and do what bad girls do. After the abortion, Lorena was despondent, unable to eat, feeling that her life was over. John contended that the abortion was a mutual decision. Spring, 1993. A customer of Lorena's at the nail salon, Regina Keegan, came in for a manicure. She saw bruises on Lorena's forearms and asked her what happened. Lorena confessed to Keegan that her husband hurt her and threatened to kill her. Keegan asked why she couldn't leave. Lorena broke down saying that if she tried to, John would kill her. Just days before Lorena attacked John, she tried to file for a protective order against her husband. The court office told her to come back later because the legal secretary wasn't in the office at the time. During this time, Lorena began the process of moving her things out to try and leave John. She chose to keep her belongings with neighbors and explained that she feared John may try to track her down. In the meantime, she continued to sleep at home with John until her move was completely finished. June 23, 1993. John came home after a night of drinking and got into bed with Lorena. She alleged that he raped her that evening. 
He jumped on top of me, and he started grabbing my arms really tight. I said, I don't want to have sex. He forced me. My underwear was ripping off. I was just fighting. He wouldn't listen. She described struggling to breathe as John's shoulder pressed into her face. John claimed the sex was consensual and that her attack afterward was based on jealousy and fear about her citizenship status. He said, there was the green card too. That didn't come to my mind at the time, but it's obvious. You have to be married to an American citizen for five years to get one, and we'd only been married for four. After the alleged assault, Lorena went to the kitchen for water to calm down and grabbed a knife. Later in court, she recalled that she was overcome by images of the abuse she'd experienced. After she saw the knife, her memory went blank. When John woke, he didn't immediately realize she'd completely cut off his penis. Seeing all the blood, he eventually got up and took himself to the hospital. Meanwhile, Lorena had gotten in the car, penis in hand, and driven off. She later testified she didn't realize what she had done until she was in the car. She then threw the penis outside of the window into a field at the intersection of Maplewood Drive and Old Centerville Road. Lorena fled to the closed salon where she worked, then to the home of her boss, Jaina Bisuti. At first, police were unsure where the severed penis was and went to the Bobbitt home. There, they began to photograph evidence, including blood and pamphlets on rape and spousal protection. When Lorena arrived at the police station, she was asked to explain where the severed penis was before she gave her testimony about her assault. At first, she said she was confused and not sure where it was. She had to be prompted before she described throwing it out the window. Police had to help her recall enough details to get an idea of where the appendage would be. She finally remembered a nearby 7-Eleven, which helped police locate the severed penis. They were able to retrieve the penis that night. Lorena consented to a rape kit in the same hospital and at the same time as John underwent surgery. Surgeons successfully reattached John's penis after a 10-hour surgery. John was charged with marital sexual assault. This is a different charge from marital rape, which in Virginia can only be applied to a victim that has been seriously injured or if the couple is physically living apart. After a highly publicized trial, John was found not guilty to the dismay of many women's groups. At the time, domestic violence and violence against women was just starting to enter the national conversation. The Violence Against Women Act, introduced by then Senator Joe Biden, was not signed into law until 1994. The trial of Lorena Bobbitt followed soon after John's. She pleaded not guilty to the charge of malicious wounding by reason of temporary insanity, a plea at the time called irresistible impulse. For days, the nation watched as events throughout the Bobbitt's marriage were relayed through court testimony. After eight days of hearings, on January 21st, 1994, Lorena was also found not guilty by a jury of seven women and five men. After the ruling, she spent 45 days in a mental hospital for evaluation and treatment, as under Virginia law, anyone acquitted with an insanity plea must be immediately evaluated. She was ruled not to be a threat to her community and was released. Each would go on to become a public figure. John would appear in multiple pornographic films. He was later accused of various crimes by other women and was convicted for most of these charges, including multiple accounts of domestic battery. Lorena went back to school and met her partner of over 20 years. Together, they had a daughter in 2005. Later, Lorena went on to found an organization to help victims of domestic violence, the Lorena Gallo Foundation. To this day, John still sends Lorena letters, cards, emails, and text messages. Some are apologetic. Some state that he misses her. Some are propositions to get back together.